Um, again, this was a talk that Michael Birch was scheduled to give, but due to weather in Toronto, it looks like he won't be here until Monday. So I will do my best to cover this stuff and also to touch back on the stuff that Kyle skipped earlier. Uh, outline here is general CBC CASPER protocols. Um, then CASPER, how we're using it um, in our chain, and then questions. So CASPER is used both by Vlad Zamfir and by Vitalik Buterin, is that how his name is pronounced, Buterin, um, to describe their uh, proof of stake algorithms. Vlad's approach is I'm sorry, Vitalik's approach is to build something that looks pretty good and then bang on it and fix any bugs they find. Vlad's approach has been to start from first principles, thus his terminology of correct by construction. Um, Vlad's, because he's starting from principles rather than a specific protocol, is really a whole family of protocols. You can get consensus on any data structure using one of these things. So what do you need? There's the thing that you're getting consensus on, a value in this set C. There's a way of talking about the values, so a logic, propositions about those values. There are the protocol states and how you move between those states. And they get, you get a category out of that. And a function E um, for estimate that maps the protocol states to true propositions about the current consensus value in C. So we've got to have at least one thing that we're getting consensus on. Um, well, sorry, at least two. If, if you only have one, then you've already achieved consensus. Um, the initial protocol it has to be able to select any element of C. That is, you can't just say, yeah, there's true and false, but we're always going to pick true. Um, the state itself is a bunch of messages that have been received having fewer than some number of faults. And faults are a parameter of this, uh, this protocol. Um, executions are when you send a message to some other validator or you receive a message from some other validator. Each message has a label that says where it came from, the sender, an estimate, which is what your view of what the state, I mean, the thing you're getting consensus on ought to be, and a justification, which is a set of other messages that you have seen uh, that inform your decision about what this estimate should be. So <coughs> protocol demands that given the justification, there's only one thing that the estimate could be, and that's determined by the function e. Since all messages have justifications, they can be causally ordered even in a full asynchronous setting. So what we get out of this structure is a DAG. Um, single actor must have serial order to their messages. So as validators see messages, they assign an ordering to them. Otherwise, they're equivocating. Uh, equivocations are detectable by means of justifications. So if you get two messages in there, and you can't causally order them properly, then they're equivocating. That is a Byzantine fault. That means things that are working together can arrange to, um, to do this to other parts of the network, try and partition the network, say one thing to one part and one thing to another part. An estimate is safe in a protocol state, sigma, if for all future states of sigma, the, I'm sorry, all future states sigma prime, the estimate gives uh, the estimate based on this state gives the same value. So there's no way that no, ma no matter what other messages you see or send, that estimate can't change. Sigma is a future state of itself by the identity. It's a local property. So each node, believe, even if the whole network hasn't achieved consensus yet, a node can know that if it ever does reach consensus, it'll reach consensus on this value. So individual nodes can know things that the whole network doesn't get. Um, typical formulation means that no other message I could receive would convince me that P does not hold. Right. 
An estimate is consensus safe if it's consistent with estimates of all future states of all protocol following actors. So uh, consensus safety is different from estimate safety. Estimate safety is what a single node sees. Uh, consensus safety is a property of the entire network that is not something that any one node can determine. Um, an estimate can be, be considered finalized when it's consensus safe. So there are messages that when you have heard from a majority of the other validators that they believe this is the right consensus, in addition to you knowing that this is the right consensus value, then you can consider it finalized. So that requires something like n squared communication to establish a finalized state. Estimate safety implies consensus safety over pr all protocol states that share a common future. So individual nodes can individually come to the realization that this is what the network's going to reach consensus on. And eventually, if it ever does reach consensus, it'll be that value. I'm not sure what S is because he didn't introduce it before, so I'll skip this. Um, it, well, safety, yes, but what are the two parameters here? I read if sigma 2 is a future of sigma 1, then it's not the case that p is safe in sigma 1 and everything other than p is safe in sigma 2? Yeah. I think this might need to go outside. That would make more sense, that, it's, that something other than p is not safe or that p is not safe in sigma 2, yeah. right. So if sigma 2 is a future, p has to be safe in both of these. I think that's where the symbols got mixed up. But, um, or maybe p is a proposition about the thing, and, and then that would make more sense. Safety oracles. These are algorithms that can determine an, if an estimate is safe. So a node can come to know that the estimate is safe. How does it do that? by using a safety oracle. Now, um, safety oracles work by creating an adversary. Now, the ideal adversary can send any kind of message anywhere. And so if you're safe against that guy, then you're safe against all lesser powered um, uh, adversaries. That guy is hard to simulate. So what you do is simulate um, somebody that's weaker but then you don't know immediately that the thing is safe. So you may get these safety oracles that say, I don't know if I'm safe yet. If you knew what the ideal adversary could do, then you could determine it. But because you don't know what the ideal adversary is going to do, because he's hard to simulate, you may be in a state where you don't know that it's safe yet, even though it is. Um, but once you know it's safe, it's definitely safe. Uh, click safety oracle is an existence proof. If protocol states were just sets of messages, all states would have a common future. Estimate safety would always imply consensus safety. So either there would be no safe estimates or the protocol would be trivial. This is why important that protocol states cannot accept more than some number of Byzantine faults. Make some states not have common futures. So just like in, in um, Bitcoin, if you have more than half the network working on a different thread, I mean, a, a different fork than the one that everybody else is working on, well, that breaks the system. Similar sorts of things happen here. If you have a whole bunch of, of uh, validators collaborating together in order to break it, there's a uh, level at which the rest can't defend against that. Partially ordered sequence of changes made to a rolling term is what we're coming to consensus on. So the state is starts in the genesis block as some rolling term and then as we get deployments we need to decide in what order those deployments happen as we get reductions we need to decide races all those sorts of things these sequence of changes made to the rolling term so how do we construct these it's typical construction sets of messages with fewer than some number of faults Messages consist of blocks containing a reference to the parent state, to the changes mo made, the, new, uh, the hash of the new state. Um, protocol executions are, again, sending and receiving blocks. Ghost is a fork choice rule. I think this stands for greed, greatest, no, greedy heaviest observed subtree. Is that right? Yeah. Um, 
fork choice rule modified for multiple parents. So in the Bitcoin approach, you'll always have a single parent that you're forking. Uh, whereas in this one, we've got a DAG and it's sort of broader than a chain. It sort of flows out. Um, I highly recommend going and looking at Michael Birch's article on Medium where he talks about Casper. There's an animated GIF there of the growth of the DAG. And it ends up being long and sinuous like a chain, but it's, it's a bit wider than a single link at each time. So greatest, greedy heaviest observed subtree gives the head of the DAG, directed acyclic graph. Following it back to the genesis block gives the sequence of changes made to the row length term. So at any point, you can see a trace of the history of the thing. Now, there may be lots of candidate terms at the end of this DAG, and each one will show different traces, but they'll achieve consensus on some, uh, it'll look rather like the Nile, right? You'll have a thin thing uh, running up to the delta, and then it spreads out from there. And so the part below, or sorry, above the delta on higher ground is the part where they've achieved consensus and finalization. At the delta, it's the spread out of possible futures. Ghost uses weights for each of the different actors in the protocol called validators. Weights come from the information contained in the Rolang term via the blessed proof of stake contract. So Michael Birch's proposal here, this is something we need to continue discussing, but his proposal is that uh, the weights are somehow derived from the hashes of the Rolang term. Weights change over time through bonding and unbonding. When determining the score of a block, weights in the parent block are used. So there are two stages to the ghost algorithm. First is, yeah. Were, um, weights, ever, were weights ever bets? They used to be. Weights used to be bets, yes. Also, um, there's no mention of the tie-breaking property, which is essential here. Um, but, yeah, yeah tie-breaking is also, I don't know all of the details of this yet. I, I just skimmed through it to make sure that I could guess. But uh, yeah, tie-breaking needs to show up sometime. Uh, so there's scoring and traversal. During scoring, latest block from each validator, um, where latest is defined by the justifications. It's the stuff at the end of the graph where new things can be attached on. Um, propagates its creator's weight back through the DAG along parent-child links. If a block is passed over multiple times, the weights are summed. As an additional step in scoring, validator's weight is added to a block which includes that validator's latest block as a step parent. During traversal, we start at genesis, and move forward through the DAG to the child of the current block which has the highest score. Now, these are a lot of words in the part that, um, that Kyle skipped, which we'll get to at the end of this presentation. Uh, there's pictures, so we'll go over those. So there is where you can find the details on the Atlassian Wiki. Things we don't have worked out yet. How many races should be allowed to be decided in a single block? So say a contract gets a message, and then there is a single message to be sent, and five different um, uh, receivers that could get it. And then within that one there are five more and within that one there are five more. So there are 125 possible executions here. Should one validator be able to pick the one trace out of those 125 or should they achieve consensus on which of the first five win and then the next five and then the next five? It, uh, the argument for the single validator is, well, all you need to do is achieve consensus. You're not trying to make it fair that certain validators um, get their turn making the decision. So if one of them picks it and everybody agrees to it, fine. The other argument is we want this to be resilient against collusion, against somebody coming in with a whole bunch of money or weight and just trampling over everybody else because then there's not no real consensus. So this is the basic question here. Um, Apart from that, basically everything involves slashing. Security, the system comes from slashing. Uh, it's entirely due to what you can detect somebody else's behavior as being. Um, therefore, 
You can't slash them on computing speed unless they're not fast enough to keep up. You can't slash them on network speed unless they're not fast enough to keep up. You can't slash them on any of their resources unless they're not living up to the uh, service level agreement of that region. Um, goals to have a system in which, which is incentive compatible, meaning that the rational decision is to follow the protocol. And slashing is the only, basically the only tool we have in shaping the incentives. Um, the primary attack vector seems to be censorship. If you claim to have seen a message before it was sent, there's cryptographic evidence. But you can say, I never saw that message arrive. It must have been the, something on your part of the network that sent it to me because I didn't ever get it. Uh, you pretend not to have received something until you see some other message and then say, oh, well, he was going to win. Um, I can draw that out here on the board. So. Say you've got one with weight 3, one with weight 2, and one with weight, um, let me make this, 4, 2, and 3. Okay. Now 2 and 3 want to collude with each other. 4 comes in, sends a message to 2. 2 would really like to get its own choice of estimate um, to win this this uh, consensus algorithm. He knows that with the support of three, he can do that. But four is going to outweigh three. So he pretends not to have seen the message from number four until he gets the message from three and then says, ah, oh, the two of us together outweigh you. That's the, the attack that we would like to prevent. Um, How do we prevent that sort of thing from happening? Um, and then there are a few other questions there. So that's the end of, of this portion of, of his talk. Are there any questions about what we've covered on these slides? Not yet. OK, great. So let's switch over to the other one. I have a question. Nash. Yeah. I mean, how does two know what three is going to do? It doesn't necessarily, but it wants to hear from three so that it can say, you know, we're colluding, we want to get this decision made. So if okay. there's a window where it says, you know, I've got, you have to respond within um, 10 seconds of receiving this thing, then um, it can wait nine seconds to receive the thing from three, and if not, then it'll respond and say, okay, four, you win. I, I don't know that that's even bad if like there's a window and you hold on to things just to see which way you'd want it to go. I don't know that that's even necessarily bad. <laughs> yeah, I mean, if two and three are colluding, they own the network, right? They have 66% of the validators. There's nothing four can do no matter what. Right? It, it can only well, there may be other ones there, but it's just trying to make sure that if three can pitch in with this, we can push it a little closer to our side winning. Uh, um, admittedly, it's, it's theoretical, but it's the sort of thing we're worried about. Go ahead. Uh, when two is waiting for three, two knows three and has an incentive why he's waiting for three, right? Yes. So uh, if two does not really know who is three, then they're couldn't be an incentive for two right. to wait. So is it currently like known? Uh, does two know three for sure? That, well, if you're colluding, then obviously there's some relationship there. But this means you collude over an identifier. Well, they may communicate off chain, right? They, they may say, you know, whenever this sort of message comes in from four, be sure and wait so that when I see the trigger, I can get my response in there first. Um, they don't necessarily need to communicate off chain every time this, this situation happens. Okay, let's see. View, present, full screen. 
<laughs> OK, so here is a network. We've got two different validators. See, this is validator with weight 2. This is the latest message he's seen, and earlier and earlier messages down to the genesis block, similarly for weight 3. Um, may or not be hard to see, but there are solid lines here, which are um, the things that they're coming to consensus on, the sub-DAG of this thing that they're agreeing on. These dashed lines are the ones that are used in the justifications. So both the solid lines and the dashed lines show up in the justifications, but only the solid lines show up in the DAG that they're achieving consensus on. Here, validator with weight 2 assigns 2 to its latest message. Weight 3 assigns 3 to its latest message. The remaining steps propagate along the dark lines. So because 2 has a dark line to this one, it gets 2. Because it has a dark line to this one, it gets 2. Because it has a dark line to that one, it gets 2. And this one gets 2. At the same time, this one has 3. So you add the 2 and the 3, and you get the 5 that's shown here. Get 5 here. This one is a dashed line, so it doesn't propagate. Right? So this one has 0, which gets added into the 5, 0, and so on. The fork choice rule. Starting here, 5 is bigger than 0, so we're going this way. And similarly, all the way up. 5 is bigger than 0, 3 is bigger than 2. Finalizing the blocks. OK, so now we're reaching a point where we want to know what has this system come to consensus on. Here's a candidate. You know, it's the first one after the genesis block. It's along the uh, ghost determined DAG. Reach there, you get the next candidate. I'm not sure what he meant to do on this slide that determined how to get there. But this clique oracle is what he mentioned earlier. This is showing how you can achieve a sa uh, an estimate safety, an estimate safety judgment of a particular candidate. So there we've got the candidate at the bottom. Then we look for places where the estimates agree. So number two has number one in its justification. Therefore, 2 agrees that 1 is part of the DAG. Here, this number 2 also has that number 1 as part of its justification. And number 3 here has that number 2 as part of its justification. So this subgraph all agrees that number 1 is part of the DAG. So you can see that. Let's see. Validator with weight 2 will never eventually see the validator with weight 3 disagreeing with this. Because this is the latest block, and it agrees that this was in it. Similarly, validator 3 will never see weight 2 disagree from it. Because its latest block also agrees that that's in it. So the maximum clique is 100% of the total weight, and number one is finalized. And then you can go on to the next candidate. Here, validator 2 sees validator 3 agreeing, but validator 3 doesn't see 2 agreeing yet with this one, because this has no justification that points to this. This one is justified by that, and that. 3 hasn't seen that 2 has accepted those messages yet, because there's no block here that includes those in its justification. So it can't consider 2 finalized. Um, here is how to do ghost traversal with multiple parents. I'm not exactly sure what that one's talking about, so I'll skip it. So we can think of the R-chain state as a large rolling term. We're breaking it up among namespaces, but other than that, it's, it's one large Rolang term. Outside users interact with this by parring in valid Rolang code. So you go to, to uh, namespace, you get the term, you say par, and then something else, and then it reduces. 
Special contracts exist at Genesis to support important functionality, the rev contract, um, proof of stake stuff, uh, and the registry. Blocks contain references to parents. The parents can't conflict with each other. The hash of the current state. All that stuff that was shown in, uh, in Kyle's presentation, the block diagram. And the consensus protocol follows the CBC Casper framework. Are there any questions about how that DAG grew? About Ghost or? I just want to provide a little bit of provenance uh, so that people m might know where, the, where does the idea of uh, justifications come from? They actually go all the way to the Highland Ong uh, game theory. Um, so if you look at the way they, they're tracking effectively what is single threadedness, and that's the notion of equ uh, equivocation here is single threadedness, is through this notion of uh, justifications. Um, and um, to the best of my knowledge, uh, Special K was the first system to use that as a security property. If you go back and look at our 2009 commits, our messaging system uses justification. So when Vlad and I were talking about this, he immediately saw that he could use this to, to, um, to go after a, 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 a specification of equivocation. So this goes all the way back to that branch of game theory. Just wanted to pass that along in case anyone's interested in sort of how, how these uh, ideas arose. Great. Any other questions? In that case, I'm going to try and look up Birch's um, article. There we go. Let's shrink it down a bit so it fits on the screen. So down here is Genesis block. We'll wait till it starts over. Oh, I'm sorry. I think it's over here was where it started. The links in red are the sub-dag that it's getting agreement on. The black links are other ones. Yeah, so it starts out with a big sort of messy blob there, but and two different forks. This one eventually won out. And so we've got these other forks coming in and growing, but this sinuous red DAG is effectively the blockchain in, in this view of the world. I just think it's a lot of fun to watch. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, over here. Uh, I think so. So. Um, can you talk a little bit about slashing and about how you detect equivocation and... Uh well, equivocation is easy, um, assuming that there's enough interconnectedness between the nodes of the... Uh, between the validators in any particular region. Um, the only way you can equivocate without being detected is um, to partition the network and say one thing to one partition and one thing to another. So you have to have fairly uh, strong control over the network within a particular region in order to equivocate without being detected. Um, for other kinds of slashing, the uh, other validators can include blocks that say, this is how long I saw it took him to respond to this message. And when enough block uh, enough validators in the region say, okay, I've seen enough evidence from other players that this guy isn't moving fast enough, then I can consolidate all of that evidence, propose it as a slashing transaction, and anyone can verify it. Um, that's not something that we've designed in great depth. Uh, we're still a ways out from there, but it's a way that it could be done. Greg, you're sort of meh. Hold on, let's get you the mic. No, I, I just I, I feel like um, some things are going to be squishier than others. So so response time is is squishy because there might be other factors, right? But uh, proof of custody, 
um, which would be a proxy for storage, feels like you can give objective uh, cryptographic evidence for. So basically, all the slashing conditions have to have objective cryptographic evidence. Otherwise, you know, it becomes a, an attack vector on the network. Yeah, for, um, for response time, um, anyway, uh, never mind. Well, for timestamps, you'd need a, a, an agreed on consensus on what the time is, which is kind of recursive. Exactly. Nash, you have? Well, I mean, in, in general, we, we want namespaces to be able to eject validators that don't perform well, right? But that doesn't necessarily mean you have to slash them. So let, let's, there, there, there's, there has to be something about payout in general, right? Because it's, it's not just about unbonding. Y you could imagine that if the protocol paid out transaction fees immediately, then what the validator does is just wait until they've collected up enough transaction fees that it's a certain percentage over their stake. And then they, they're, they're free to lie, they're free to walk, they're free to you know, just go quiescent, whatever, right? And so there has to be something um, in terms of the payout that is uh, delayed or, do you see what I'm saying? Certainly we had intended to delay the unbonding um, payback uh, for a significant amount of time, maybe a year, right? That it's... Uh, uh, unbonding makes sense, right? But, 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 uh, but, it only, but it doesn't make sense unless there's also a corresponding thing on transaction fees. Well. You could just make make it so that you don't get any of it until you unbond and you walk away. You have to cash in all your chips. Yeah, so I think uh, it, it increases, it does increase the security to like withhold payment of fees if, but uh, kind of only if you assume that the participation won't change, that the amount of bonding won't change. But if say there are people with who have to make regular payments to keep their infrastructure running and then they need to finance their uh, expenses that might actually reduce participation and that in, in turn reduces security. So while you know the equilibrium is more robust if you withhold payments, it may be that it, incre it, cr it creates a barrier to entry and therefore reduces participation. And so you, it's, it's a trade-off and it's not super clear that uh, it's going to be worth it. Yeah, so one of these squishy things where we have to build the network and try it out to see what happens. Great. Any other questions? I mean, can there be some short term and some long term? Can the compensation be some portion is paid immediately and some is long term? And it's a matter of playing with the percentage, how much you hold back for the long term. I mean, it's similar to executive compensation, right? Um, so you drive similar behaviors in the thing. Yeah, so give your validators a golden parachute. <laughs> <laughs> a sure good behavior, yeah. I mean, if the withdrawal period is on the order of month and one month instead of a year, and you can do a partial withdrawal, then you might be able to solve this problem, where your stake increases as you do stuff, and then you're free to reduce your stake, and leave part of it, and then in a month you'll get what you reduced. Yeah, there are all kinds of policies that we can choose for this. Um, and we need to try out some and see how they work. Or some brilliant mathematician needs to come along and prove <laughs> equations about. Yeah, equilibrium. Yes, <laughs> equilibrium. Great. Thank you very much.